Hey, Troy Hurd with Cedar Creek Dulcimers again. We're going to make a dry run through of one of our mountain dulcimer kits. Now, just to let you know, the idea behind this is not to replace the written instructions that come with your mountain dulcimer kit. What I would like to do is just show you the type of work that's going to be involved with putting a kit together and also give you an idea of how the pieces fit together. So let's get started. Well, the first thing we want to do is sand our headpiece. Get those saw marks off of there where we've cut it with the bandsaw. Now, of course, you can sand by hand, do all your, matter of fact, you can do the whole kit just completely by hand. But if you do have a couple power tools, it'll save you a little uh, time in your building. One thing that's really helpful on this is just these inexpensive little drum head sanders that you can put into your drill bit. And for this area, that works really good because it allows you to get into all those curves nice and easily. So that's one way you can speed up your sanding. So after we got our headpiece sanded, we're going to glue our sides into the slots that are in the headpiece. Now, on the hourglass shaped kits like the Cedar Creek and the Walnut Classic, the Six String and the Banjo Dulcimer, any of the kits where the sides have to be boiled and steam bit to shape, we've already done that. Matter of fact, anything that requires a jig, we've taken care of. Like even the tailpiece, it requires a jig to attach the tailpiece, so we've already done that for you. So, after we've sanded our headpiece, we got those slots. We're going to glue the sides into those slots. And any good old woodworker's glue, Elmer's Carpenter's, Franklin's Type Bond, just whatever woodworker type glue that you're familiar with. Now, before the glue sets up and dries in these little slots, we got two of these little wedges. We're going to put glue on the smooth side of the wedge and we're going to shove it into each one of those corners nice and tight. And those are permanent. What we're doing is we're reinforcing our angles and we're also pushing those sides up nice and tight so there's no gap showing. So you're going to have one on each one of your side pieces uh, in, in that wedged into that corner. Now, after that's set and dry, you can see the basic shape is there. But just to make sure the dimensions are more exact, we got these temporary braces that put everything to the correct shape. Now, you don't glue these in. They're just going to hold the shape until your first board is attached. So, the longest brace is going to let you know how wide the bottom needs to be. Now, a piece of masking tape or duct tape, just something to hold it in place. I mean, if you have a bar clamp, of course, you can slide that over the top if you like. But it's not under a whole lot of pressure, so not that necessary. Just a strip of tape will be fine. In the instructions, we even tell you how you can take and make a little nail jig out of some finishing nails if you wanted to. But when you're only doing one, eh, that's not that big of a deal. So the longest brace across the bottom, the little brace in the middle, and the middle size brace up here at the top. Now, one more thing before we glue that first piece of wood. We got four of these little strips. You're going to glue one of them right up flush to the top of each side piece like so. And clothespins work great for this. Just pop a clothespin every so often to hold them in place. Uh, and, uh, and usually you don't have any trouble with it bending like this, you know, uh, because it's flexible enough. But especially once you get your glue on there. But if it does break on you, don't worry about it. Just take wherever it broke from and just continue to glue on. Because these have nothing to do with the tone and you don't see them. They're just for glue and surface is all that they're there for. Okay, so now we got our glue strips in place. Now, one more thing before we glue uh, our first piece of wood on. We want to make sure that everything is level uh, on our glue strips. You know, because uh, we can't, even though we try to get everything nice and level, your glue strips can be sticking up a little bit or they can be down just a little bit. So we'll want to level all that off, first of all. We also want to make sure that our sides are all good and level into our slots up here at the top, too. Now, there's also going to be a little bit of your tail block sticking up. It's just the way we have to put it in the jig. The tail block has to be designed that way to make it fit in the jig properly. So you'll even have a little bit of excess on the one side of your tail block you'll need to sand. Now, a real simple thing you can do is you can take just a block of wood like I did here and, and put some sandpaper over the top of it. And uh, then what you could do is just take and level everything down. Uh, until you got it all nice and smooth, you know, got you a good flat even surface. Now on the tail block right there, I mean, you can sand it down with your hand block, of course, uh, but it's going to take a little bit. There's just a little bit of a lip there. So if you did have a power sander, that'll make that go a little quicker. Or you could even use 
uh, wood rafts like the Stanley Sureform Shaver. Um, I'm, you can even pick these up at Walmart. And then what you could do is with your wood rafts, you could just scrape across it and that'll knock it down a little bit quicker if you'd prefer. And then now once everything is level, one more thing before we glue our first piece of wood. We need to cut some type of a sound hole to let the sound come out. And I'm going to get a finished dulcimer so you can see what I'm talking about. Now, in the instructions, we're going to give you the patterns for all the different sound hole designs that we do. Uh, now, what we in the production shop, we use a scroll saw when we cut these out. So after you trace out your pattern, uh, you know, of course, we have to drill a hole and mount the scroll saw blade. We cut it out, drill another hole and, and mount the scroll saw blade and cut it out. Copen saw blade, a lot of people use Dremel tools. Now, if that is the only part of the kit you don't want to do, but you don't mind doing all the rest of the work, uh, for $15 added to the price of your kit, you can get a top that we've already pre-cut on the scroll saw if you would prefer. So if that is the only part of the kit you don't want to do, you can get that step done. So in the instructions, we recommend uh, uh, gluing your top on first. That way you can look down through to make sure that your sound holes are all lined up with your framework. So we'll line everything up and once again we're going to put our glue around all of our gluing surfaces. Then we're going to glue the frame to that whole piece of wood. Something heavy to hold it down. Encyclopedias, bricks, telephone books. Just make sure you're on a good flat surface so everything's level. And then just something heavy for weight. Now once again if a person has clamps and all that's just fine you can use your clamps if you prefer as well too. Then after it's dry once it's glued into place those sides are going to stay once they're glued there so now we can pop out all of our temporary braces because once it's glued it's going to stay to the shape. Now whatever excess is hanging over we want to trim away that excess. Now the wood's thin it's not difficult to cut so even the harder wood like the cherry wood and the walnut the wood's thin enough just a sharp knife, like our sheetrock knife, will even cut the wood. Now, instead of sitting there whittling it all day, if we were using the knife, though, what we would actually do is we get as close as we can without scoring the sides. Matter of fact, you want to you want to keep your blade level too. Don't try to angle it because you can cut some of the good side you're wanting to keep. So, as close as you can with your blade straight up and down, you kind of lightly score it little deeper and about the third or fourth time you'll cut all the way through and again make sure you're on a good flat surface if you are using the knife now of course you know copen saw scroll saw dremel tool any of those things will work as well too but like i say you don't have to even have you can do completely everything by hand if you want to now uh, a lot of people want to know if they can actually pre-cut their shape before they put their uh uh, glue their top on and that's all right just make sure that you don't cut exactly on the line that you drew leave yourself a little bit of a lip leeway so that way in case the frame shifts on you just a little bit as you're gluing uh, you, you got some leeway to work with there and then you can sand the rest of it down whatever's left over or once again that Stanley Sureform shaver works really good where you can actually just rasp it back you know with your uh, with the shaver like so you know to get it rest of the way smooth okay now before we glue our back on on the walnut classic kit we have six permanent braces on the Cedar Creek kit you'll only have three but on, on the Walnut Classic kit, we do what's called book matching of the wood. Before we thin the wood down to this thickness, we take and split it on a resaw, lay the two halves open to get a mirror image or as close to identical image on one side as the other. The idea is kind of help balance the vibration between the base and treble. And uh, since the wood is book matched, uh, to help support that wood, if you're ever out camping for a week or when you got the dulcimer hanging on the wall when you're not playing it, because it does make a nice decoration, that just makes sure the humidity won't bow or warp the wood. Well now on the Walnut Classic, both the top and bottom are book matched, so you'll, you'll have six braces for this one. On the Cedar Creek, only the top is book matched, so you only have to brace the top and not the back. But your, your uh, permanent braces, they're going to be in your little parts bag here. And now the permanent braces, they're a lot smaller and they're shorter than the temporary braces because you don't need these touching the sides. Just glue one directly in the lower part of the, of the, of the dulcimer, the longer one down there, the short one in the center, and the middle size one up top. Now usually on all the sound holes that we've designed, I'll get that frame out of the way so you can see a little better. 
we usually design it to wear right ab above whatever silhouette, whether it's the hummingbird or the butterfly or the deer or the dove. We usually got a space right across where you can put your, your permanent brace and to where you won't see it through any of the sound holes. Uh, but if you're doing a design of your own and it's not allowing you to go straight across with the brace, you can go at an angle just so one side supports the other side is all that's important with it. So if you need to go at an angle, you definitely can. Okay, so we've got our, our framework built, got our glue strips on, got the top board glued into place. Now we got our, our three permanent braces attached to our top board. Now, before we glue the back on, we need to attach three permanent braces. If it's a Walnut Classic model, we need to attach three permanent braces to the back as well. So what you'll want to do is take your frame, trace the shape of your frame on your board so you, you know exactly where those braces need to go. And again, just in the wider part, somewhere in the wider part, just put your bigger brace, your longer brace. The little brace will be in the middle and the top brace up there. That way when you set it back down and glue it to it, your braces are in the correct place. And then we're going to trim away the leftover, sand him down just like we did with the top. Okay, finishing out your fretboard, you're going to install your fret wire. Now the fret wire itself has little teeth molded into it. So you don't have to try to shove glue in those little cracks. The little teeth, will, you'll just set them down into the slot and, and, uh, and try to make sure everything's just, just level with it. Uh, it's real easy to put fret wire in. The, the one trick to it is not to pound too hard because it's a nickel silver material, so it's a softer material. So if we was to just take our regular hammer and just tap real hard in, in one location, we could bend that fret wire a little bit and then when we try to pound this in, that end will come up and you got a, uh, a rocking cradle effect going on. So if you are using just a regular hammer, make sure that you just very lightly tap when you're putting it in because it doesn't take a lot of pressure. Now, kind of a fail-safe way to make sure you don't put too much pressure are these rubber mallets like this because they, they're, they're a softer hammer to begin with and then it's got a big wide surface to it so that way you can't accidentally put too much pressure just in one little location. So what we'll do is we just, now ideally you wouldn't want to be doing it on your frame like this. You'd want to be on a good hard flat surface. That's the other trick to it as well too. On a good hard flat surface, every little bit of effort you put into tapping will, will uh, be beneficial. If you got it on a surface that'll bounce, you know, well then you're, you're wasting a lot of your productivity there. So, but just to give you an idea, you would just very lightly tap it in like so until you got him seated into place. Then we'll want to snip off as close as we can with our wire cutters and just take regular wire cutters like so and just snip it off as close as you can. Now, obviously I don't have him seated in there because I want to pull him back out. But after you snip, it's going to leave a sharp little edge. Now, one or two things. You could either just take a flat file and just file it down individually with a flat file like so. Or if you do have a belt sander, here's another way you can save yourself a little time. After you get all the frets into position, you can just take it on a belt sander and just sand everything flush like so. Now, after I sand it flush this way, personally, I like to put a little bevel to it as well, too. So after I've, san after I've sanded or filed it flush, I like to, to come with my file at a little bit of an angle like so. And it puts a nice little bevel on the side of your fret as well, too. That's just a personal preference of mine is all. Not necessary to have to do. And so now we got all of our frets in our fretboard, and now we're ready to, to attach our fretboard. Of course, our top board will be attached on there as well, too. Matter of fact, let me grab that top board just to show you here again, too. We're going to put our, lay our top board into place. Of course, at this point, you know, the, uh, and, and the reason why the sides are sticking out too much, because I don't have that brace in place, just to let you know. Um, and then, uh, of course, our sides will be trimmed at this point as well, too. So we're going to take our, 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 um, our fretboard and into our box that we've built at this point. We're going to just glue our fretboard right to the top board. And again, something heavy just to hold it in place. Encyclopedias, bricks, telephone books. If you are using a clamp, make sure uh, that you don't put too much pressure, for example, more clamping pressure in the middle than you do the edges over here because the middle will give, the top and the bottom have a solid block under them, so they can't give. But your middle can give, so if you are using clamping pressure to clamp your fretboard down, make sure you look down at, 
and eye it to make sure you don't have a little under dip from putting too much pressure in the center. And that's actually where just putting something for weight works good. You know, uh, if you use encyclopedias or a cinder block, you know for sure you're putting the same clamp, you know, weight pressure across everything. Now, up here at the top, just let me show you this. Um, you're going to just put it flush to your to your headpiece up there. Of course, your top board is going to be underneath it right there, but just so you could see it a little easier, it's going to go flush to your headpiece. Now, down here at the bottom, you're going to have excess of actually everything hanging over the fretboard. I mean, over your tail block. There's going to be some of your fretboard hanging over, your top and your bottom boards are going to hang over. You even have a little bit of the sides hanging over. Whatever is, is left hanging over the end of your tail block, just trim everything flush and then sand it smooth, you know, so you're down smooth. Uh, let me get you a finish deal. So just say, cut it, trim it as close as you can, then sand everything smooth to the tail block. Then if you notice, after we cut that fretboard, instead of leaving it square, we sort of round that edge just a little bit. That way the strings have a nice curve to come over the top instead of that sharp angle um, like so. Okay, then we're going to take, and now we're going to just final sand everything down. And remember, in the instructions, we're going to tell you what grits of sandpaper to use for all these different steps. Like I say, this isn't meant to replace those written instructions. It's just meant to kind of enhance them just a little bit. Okay, so now we've got our box all built. We've final sanded it down. We're ready to put our finish on. Now, about 25, 27 years ago, after the, the fourth or fifth fiddle maker kept telling me, you need to try true oil, you need to try true oil. We finally decided to start trying true oil and we've been using it ever since. It's a gunstock finish actually is what it is, but what's nice about it is it starts off with a linseed oil base like say a Danish oil might, but they add hardening agents to it. So it doesn't just keep soaking in and soaking in and soaking in and soaking in like a Danish oil might, you know. And uh, so, so the advantage with that is, is you can get the effect you want with very few coats. And because you want to get the look of your finish and, and, and the, uh, the coverage you want with as few coats as possible because the more finish you add, the more weight you add to the wood. And the more weight you add to the wood, the less it vibrates. And so that's why I, we found out why the fiddle makers, you know, like this true all so well. Because with just three or four coats, you get, I, I'll, I'll bring the finished one back over again. But with just three or four coats, you get a, you know, it brings out the color, makes a nice sheen to it. And, uh, and so it protects the wood, brings out the grain color. Now we like to keep it with just three or four coats because it gives you, it leaves you with a semi-gloss look like this. And the reason why we like that is because, like I say, it does bring out the color and the grain, but it doesn't show fingerprints every time you touch it. So you're not constantly wiping it down if the shiny, the finish is too shiny. But if you want a shiny finish, you know, if you put five, six coats of True on, that still wouldn't be enough to hurt your tone. I mean, you can make it to where it's a real shiny finish if you'd like to. Some other things that do work well, like a spray lacquer, like they use on guitars a lot, and uh, that's another thing that works well. Now, if you do have a finish you're familiar with, that you, you're a woodworker and you got a finish that's tried and true for you, you can use that as well. I had one furniture maker one time, for example, that says he finishes all of his furniture with paste wax on a buffing wheel, and that's what he does. He just busts it, busts it with the paste wax, and that's his finish. Well, he did his dulcimer that way, brought it in. It looked basically the same as this true all finish, had a great tone, so there you go, you know. Uh, so if you do have a finish that, that you know about and works for you, go ahead and use it, of course. Okay, and then after our finish, we're going to mount all of our hardware. And let me take this headpiece back apart so we can get a closer look at it. Um, the holes are already drilled. The tuning pegs, uh, they have a post, and you just slide the post through the hole. Now, in the instructions, we talk about a left and a right tuning knob. And, and for example, what that refers to is on, on two of the tuning knobs, the post is on the left side, and on the other two, it's on the right side. Well, obviously, you really can't get them mixed up because you see how when I try to put a left and right on the same side, how they overlap, you know. Now, all that refers to is the reason why we tell you we, you want the gear facing back towards your instrument. All that is is when you turn the knob, that means when you turn the knob clockwise, it'll make your note go higher. You turn the knob counterclockwise, it'll make your note go lower. All that would happen is if you did get them reversed and you put, you know, the face in the other way, clockwise would lower your note and counterclockwise would raise your note. That's all the difference it would make, you know, uh, but other than that. So when you poke the post through the hole, 
like we'll put this on the other side, each time the gear is facing back towards the instrument. Now there's two little Phillips head screws to hold it in position. It is a good idea to pre-drill those holes. The screws will go in a little bit easier. If you don't have a drill bit the correct size, uh, a finishing nail works great. You know, just drill your little pilot hole with a finishing nail. All right, and then we have these little brass pins down at the bottom. Now these little nails down at the bottom, that's what you're going to tap in and, and that's what you anchor your strings on when, uh, when you're ready to string your dulcimer up. Now uh, there's a little gadget called the nut and the bridge that, that uh, guides your strings. Now the nut is the one up here at the top that has the little cuts into it and that's what helps guide your strings into the tuners. And what you'll do with that is you'll have the slot and you just set, set it into the slot and you don't even have to glue it because once your strings are on the weight of the strings will hold it down. Now the bridge down at the other end has a little bevel sanded into the slot of it and you don't have to make any cuts at all just set it into position and once again the weight of the strings will hold it in place. And uh, the reason why I brought that up, because if you want to, you can just do like we do, where to put these pins at the bottom. You can just sort of eye it, you know, put one here, one there, split the difference for the center. But what we tell you in the instructions is, if for simplicity's sake, for doing your first one, if you want to make sure you're lined up exactly with these cuts, what you can do is before you put the nut into place, you could put it down below and then just put a mark by each one of your slots and that's where you would place your nail so you know you're for sure lined up exactly with the grooves at the, at the top of your dulcimer. Now one or two things, you can do like we did on the dulcimer I just showed you where we just had three pins. Since the first two are so close together, you can put both of them on the same pin because by the time you come over the top, you got plenty of time to slide them apart. And Chaz, when he builds the instruments like this one, that's the way he likes to do it because there's less pins down there. But everybody has their own pet peeves, what they like. We include four pins because we got some in the shop that look to like to put a separate pin for each one. And so, and so you will have four of those pins in there. So you can do it like Chaz does, or you can do it to where you actually put a separate pin for each one if you want to as well too. And if you notice how we always drop at least one of them, and usually the middle one, that way you're not making a wedge by, by pounding those pins in straight across, you know, and, and perhaps creating a little wedge. So if you drop it down, it, it it helps to alleviate that. Uh, the pins are so thin you shouldn't have a problem with you know creating a wedge to split it but eh, better safe than sorry. And once again it is a good idea to you know just pre-drill the hole just a little bit. You don't you don't have to drill the hole all the way deep but just something to start it makes it helpful for tapping it into place there. Alrighty and then so now we've got the the uh, you know the instrument all built you know the finish is put on we got our pins mounted now we're ready to put on our strings and if you would like uh, there is a whole section on the last part of the instructional uh, video that's teaching you how to play the mountain dulcimer there is a section on care and maintenance that that goes into more detail about putting a string on and stuff but let me just show you real quick the strings will have little loops on the end of them and so what you'll do is the you'll you'll just hook the loop over that pin that you hit nailed into the bottom and then up here at the top in your tuner let me see if i can get one of these here where we can see it i'll, I'll try to put it to where john can see it right there there's going to be these holes in your tuner and and whichever hole is convenient for you to put it through and then pop slide the string through the hole Push most of the slack through because it's these are guitar strings, so they're a lot longer than you need. So push the most of the slack through so you're not, you know, don't got a bunch of excess you have to wind, 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 wind. And leave enough slack so you know that when you turn the knob, it'll wrap around that post at least three or four times. And then whatever excess is hanging over, you'll snip off the excess with your wire cutters. And as I said, we do go through a little more detail on the stringing and the tuning of it at the end of the uh, Mountain Dulcimer instructional lesson there too which I encourage you to watch after you're all done so you know how to tune up your dulcimer and play it as well too. Now one last thing, there's going to be a little stick in here left over. Now the traditional way to play the mountain dulcimer, they didn't use their finger, they used that little piece of wood. And so uh, when they invented the dulcimer, it was set up actually to imitate a bagpipe of all things. So the first two strings represent the flute part of the bagpipe. Well, the other two represent the drones of the bagpipe, like they're squeezing out of the bellows. So that's why you weren't even supposed to chord them originally. Then a piece of wood. 
something they could slide, added that whiny sound to give it more of the bagpipey feel. Well, most people decided they didn't like the whiny sound all the time. They used their finger instead to get it a softer sound. But just so you'll know, that's not a spare part left over, so don't think you forgot a part and tried to make a sound post out of it or something. Anyway, that's basically what it looks like as to put a kit together to give you an idea of the, the amount of work that's involved with it and, uh, and also to help you see how all the pieces do fit together. And as I said before, we go through a whole lot more detail in the actual instructions, you know, step by step, what grits of sandpaper to use for this step and so forth, you know. And then there's a little blow up sheet on the front of it. That way when you read about a part and it says get the nut from the parts bag and you're looking for the other end of the bolt, well you'll realize when we talk about the nut that we're referred to that little deal at the top that has the cuts into it right there. So it kind of help you out as well. Well have a lot of fun doing your kit and if you are into any part of your kit and you do have a question that you would like to double check before you cut or glue something together, feel free to give us a call and ask us uh, at our shop in Branson, you know, 417-334-1395. Or if you want to catch us on our website or email us, you can do that so as well. But have fun.